Here we go. What I directed to be done against Bob Minton and what I did to Bob Minton has haunted me for a long time. And I am sorry for what I did to destroy him or to seek to destroy him. Is Mike Rinder so upstaffed that he can't be questioned? Or do I not have the rank to ask that question? I have been debating for some time on making a video about all this. It's been hard to hear some of the things that have been going around regarding people in the SPTV community, the Aftermath Foundation and Excientology in general. And I tell you, the further I go down into this rabbit hole, the less I like it here. This video is a call and a respectful request that Mike Rinder steps down from the Aftermath Foundation board. I think this is the best decision moving forward and I'm gonna get into the reasons why. Um, so stick with me through that. For those that don't know me, my name is Kelly. I live in England and I grew up in Scientology. My parents were public members. Uh, my dad worked on staff for a little bit. Um, and was an OT5. <laughs> but when I was six years old, I had a security check done on me. And at six years old, I was labeled a suppressive person by my sec checker, who is known as Ewan Scarlet. If you're out there, please get in touch because I got some questions for you, sir. But yeah, so I've been a suppressive person, enemy of the church since I was six years old. Um, I never intended to talk about Scientology. I was happy to leave it in its dark, icky past. But in 2020, during the lockdown, my dad got in touch with me after 10 years of no contact. So he got back in touch and naturally, you know, I had some questions about what happened to me as a kid. So we started talking and um, throughout us talking, I was like, holy fuck, I need to share this. And so I came to YouTube on my own, not part of any group, not part of any anything. I came here to share my story. Um, and I did. And I made a whole series about Scientology. I came back last year, the beginning of last year. Um, I was approached by a couple of creators. I came back to YouTube and now I'm making videos about Scientology because clearly there is more to the story. Anyway, that's just a little bit of background so y'all know where I am coming from. These online disputes have been going for a number of months now and arguably this all started back in November when Aaron Smith-Levin from Growing Up in Scientology was booted out of the Aftermath Foundation. Aaron Smith-Levin is a YouTuber and ex-Scientologist who's been making videos for about eight years, exposing the abuses of Scientology and sharing survivor stories. He helped found the foundation and has raised thousands and thousands of dollars for them. Uh, the board members were unhappy with his behavior and thus kicked him out. Now, Aaron made this video on November 20th, kind of explaining everything uh, that went down. Eight days ago, last Sunday, I was voted off the board of the Aftermath Foundation. The official reason for my removal was a video that I did two weeks ago, um, calling out an attorney, one of the attorneys representing Val Haney in her trafficking suit against Scientology. And I didn't say the name of the attorney, um, the name, the title of the video was something like uh, attorney makes huge mistake in Scientology trafficking case. And that video was about Graham Barry. And you wouldn't know that if you'd seen the video, because I never said Graham Barry's name in the video. If you already knew that Graham Barry was the one guy who was supposed to show up to that hearing, then you knew that's who I was talking about. Apparently, that video that I did about Graham Barry violated the Aftermath Foundation's code of ethical conduct. Now, not only was it a surprise to me that a video such as the one that I did would violate 
the Aftermath Foundation's Code of Ethical Conduct. It was in fact a surprise to me that the Aftermath Foundation had a code of ethical conduct. It turns out that less than 12 weeks ago, unbeknownst to me, and through a vote that I was not aware of and did not participate in, the foundation adopted a code of ethical conduct that prohibits any board members from criticizing, publicly criticizing, any individual or any organization that does any type of work with or for the Aftermath Foundation or is engaged in any type of work even similar to the Aftermath Foundation. And on the same evening, Mark, Mike, and Claire made this video. We are here. Yeah, we, I was going to say, we were going to do a video um, with all of us here in Colorado. And um, then there was a, a video that came out this morning, and that sort of changed our uh, itinerary for the video tonight. Look, if you are waiting for some bombshell to be dropped by us, um, in response to Aaron's video, uh, you should switch off right now because that's not going to happen. Um, we all watched Aaron's video. Um, we are not going to respond to the numerous misrepresentations, omitted information, um, outright things that are untrue in that video um because that is exactly what osa wants us to do they didn't address anything that was going on it was a terrible terrible live stream because they talked about gingerbread houses and let me tell you nobody cared about the gingerbread house that evening but one thing that they always spend money on is <laughs> nonsense <laughs> this is a cake Unfortunately, I have been made privy to emails that I was never meant to see. And honestly, if I hadn't seen them with my own two eyes, I would never have believed they even happened. Welcome back for SPTV Monday Night Live. Everyone, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Mike Rinder is an ex-Scientologist and former head of the Office of Special Affairs, which is a very senior position in the church. Please welcome Mr. Mike Rinder. Mike has been talking about Scientology for the last 15 years. He left in 2007 and became a sort of indie Scientologist for a few years. And then packed that in and went on to do a show with Leah Remini called Leah Remini Scientology and the Aftermath. He also released a book called A Billion Years and he has a podcast and YouTube channel and blog where he continues to document his findings. Now nobody here is negating the good work that Mike Rinder has done to expose parts of Scientology. However, the Church of Scientology is a racketeering group. For anyone that doesn't know what racketeering is, it's where a group of individuals work together to carry out criminal illegal actions for financial gain and profit. And I think we can all agree that Scientology is very concerned about financial gain and profit. Now, I'm not sat here with a list of accusations of who has done what, or anything but what i do know is that we need names you cannot take an entity like the church of scientology and put that in jail it's a group name it doesn't mean anything a a entity can't carry out a crime only people can so we need names and we need them now 
people need to start being held accountable for their actions within this group, whether they have left or not. I'm not accusing anyone of anything because guess what, I do not know what these people know. The recent controversy has been brought up because of a lady named Miriam Francis. Miriam Francis is a child SA survivor. She has been working to take her abuser to justice for 12 years and she reached out to the Aftermath Foundation and Mike Rinder for help. Miriam Francis reached out to Alex from Down the Rabbit Hole News after expressing concern over her interactions with Mike Rinder. Miriam had 16 questions posed for Mike which were forwarded by Alex. 1. Why did you feel it was okay to threaten and, a, and attempt to intimidate me? 2. If you didn't commit any crimes, how could a record of our conversation be incriminating for you? 3. Why did you lie to me and say that you had, ob uh, had obtained the information that I needed related to evidence for my case in an attempt to use that as leverage against me? 4. You have given a statement in the Baxter case stating your direct involvement in legal issues at Flag in Clearwater. The mother of Tony Strawn's victim said in her testimony that Osa had told her not to go to authorities following the sexual battery offenses that he committed against her two children in 1994. What involvement did you have in dissuading the mother of Tony Strawn's victims not to go to authorities? Five. Did you know that it's a crime in the state of Florida where you reside to tamper with a witness, which includes harassment, intimidation, and interfering with a victim? Six, most people get their Aftermath Foundation ap applications approved in one to two days. I applied for funds for post-traumatic stress relief, and it's been four weeks and no answer. Is that a result of your personal retaliation against me? These questions were very pointed and emotionally charged, which is understandable, but if I were Mike, I would have not answered them either. But I believe a letter from a lawyer who represents the Aftermath Foundation is an inappropriate response. Miriam Francis felt that she needed an advocate to help her get her answers because she was finding herself feeling intimidated and scared by her interactions with Mike Rinder. Apart from bringing LAPD to the Aftermath show set and sitting in the room with me while I gave my statement to police officers, Leah Remini nor Mike Rinder have ever offered me any assistance, nor have I asked for it until recently. I am thankful for Leah Remini for being a badass troublemaker, for daring to ask questions. I am grateful that I got the opportunity to share my story on season two, episode one of Leah Remini Scientology and the Aftermath. The reach and impact that this show has had has been incredible. It is unfortunate that in the episode that I appeared in, a misrepresentation was created in the editing of two separate statements that I made about two completely different things. They were mashed together while a reenactment of a child in pajamas appeared on the screen. They did this because I refused to go into the details of description of sexual abuse acts perpetrated against me and the producer pressured me while the entire crew watched from behind the cameras. <laughs> the inaccuracy that was inserted into my story through the editing process minimizes the actual and very real harm that I experienced which spanned across two countries and occurred over a time period of at least four years. On the 4th of January, 2024, LAPD submitted their report to the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office and is currently awaiting a decision to prosecute. Leading up to the Aftermath show, Rinder kept saying that my story is the one that could bring down Scientology. In fact, he convinced production that my story was so valuable, it justified the cost of my airfare from Australia, which they were hesitant to pay for. He said to them, if there is one story you need to cover, it's hers. Why was he so adamant about the value, credibility, and accuracy of my story? 
A child sexual assault claim can only affect the reputation of an organization if they were themselves involved, covered it up, or knew about the cover-up of the crime. Why did Mike Rinder believe this to be true in relation to my case? Perhaps this will shed some light on that. Matt Pesch, a board member of the Aftermath Foundation, described in a YouTube video about a slush fund that he was required to keep to cover up crimes of a sexual nature. I mean, you got the Office of Special Affairs, OSA. That's a huge part of the Sea Org organization. That's a big, you know, uh, network of Sea Org members. And they're only there for the, uh, to silence people who want to speak out, speak the truth about Scientology, or cover for people who have done uh, crimes. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've seen a lot of it because when I was the Treasury Secretary, for the flag service organization, I always had to make sure I kept uh, uh, money set aside for emergencies. What kind of emergencies? Uh, how about an adult doing something they weren't supposed to do to a child? And the way Scientology would handle that is to get usually both of them like quickly out of the state and uh, not report it to the authorities. I mean, I could start naming names and, and things like that. and. Uh, but I can I can tell you, that's that's how it works. That's how it how it works in there. Yeah. You said that it that there were more. I mean, how many sexual molestations were you aware of at Flagland Base of of children? Shit. Um, I mean, it sometimes it was adults too. Um, but let's see. So I mean, there was rapes of adults too. But let me see. Really? Yeah. Um, a children. I don't know. I can think of two right off. You know, Alexandra and, and uh, about a. 12 year old girl and then so there's rapes where, where men raped women mm -hmm. and this doesn't get reported to the police no this is shocking that the church intentionally covers up felony sexual rapes or sexual molestations yep. and its handling is to get the people out of the state out of the jurisdiction yep in an email to the mother of a child rape victim the details of which she posted in a comment on Mike Rinder's blog, Matt Pesh describes the OSA, that OSA covered up this instance of child rape in Florida in 1996, and that he, Matt Pesh, transferred funds to move the victim and the perpetrator across state lines to get them out of jurisdiction of where the crime was committed. Matt Pesh wrote, the OSA drill for this sort of thing goes something like this. One, convince both parties that they are responsible and grossly out ethics. They have put the church at risk and they need to withhold what happened for the great good. Cover up anything that might not be good PR for the church. Two, get both parties immediately out of the state, in this case, Florida. Three, follow up to keep the flap secret and or make it go away. There aren't any Hubbard documents that exist, which explicitly detail step by step how to cover up crimes of a sexual nature. If they existed, we would have heard of them. So this detailed step by step procedure had to have been created by someone else. Matt Pesh said it's an OSA drill. Who created, directed, or authorized this OSA drill? Could it have been the person who was the head of OSA for 25 years, Mike Rinder? The perpetrator in my case was moved to England in 1998 after the crimes against me were made known by him during an interrogation in 2001 when I was 16 years old. I wrote a letter to David Miscavige via the Religious Technology Center letterbox demanding consequences for the perpetrator for what he had done to me, and soon after that, I was moved to England as well. Does this now sound familiar? In fact, the perpetrator received an order from his senior official to get me over there and make sure I liked being there. I have no problem with people whistleblowing, but should they be put on any foundation purporting to help victims of the type of crimes that they themselves covered up? Could that be considered a conflict of interest? Any organization, person or group should be assessed for the harm that they do as well as the good. I retain my right to ask questions and to speak freely about the personal harm that I have experienced. 
Every time that Mike Brinder announces to the world that he destroyed people's lives, he is met with praise and applause. Is Mike Rinder so upset that he can't be questioned? Or do I not have the rank to ask that question? Miriam reached out to Down the Rabbit Hole News to be an advocate and Alex the Rabbit forwarded Miriam's questions over to Mike Rinder and was met with this response. This is a letter from a lawyer <laughs> and included a rather distasteful quote at the end saying, those that lie down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. Do they have a PR team? They need a PR team, oh my. <sighs> If the mission statement of the Aftermath Foundation is to help people start their lives again and rebuild, actually I should probably include the actual mission statement, let me get it, let me get it. The Aftermath Foundation, a charity whose purpose is to help those who want to leave Scientology and the Sea Org but who lack a system of support that they can rely on whilst getting on their feet in the outside world. Um, we're talking about a nonprofit that is also a public charity. And charities often serve what we call vulnerable populations. Right? Um, I would consider um, cult survivors a vulnerable population. They have been traumatized. They've been traumatized. We're out, we're allies, right? The quote never ends, our allies, and we're here to help because we are outraged at the, um, at the abuses that we've seen by Scientology. And that's why we're here to support. My questions were building for my printer. So I thought, well, what the heck? Why don't I just ask him some questions? And look, he did agree to that. He said, okay. And I said, look, if you want to, we can do that in a phone conversation. And he, um, and he agreed and, and we scheduled a time and we spoke. Um, it was via WhatsApp and um, it was two phone calls. And that took place in early January. It was in like the first week of January. Um, in that conversation, I asked him the questions that I had that were regarding details of the how how the crimes against me would have been covered up. He had described um, the functions of the organi organization, how the information would have come about, how it would have been handled, who would have been sent to. What I heard him say throughout that conversation is he kept saying the Office of Special Affairs International. I just like, I he, he was giving me a lot of names. He gave me lawyer names that um, possibly could have been involved. And um, Again, I appreciate that information, but when I'm hearing constantly the Office of Special Affairs International, and I'm speaking to the guy who was the head of Office of Special Affairs International, I don't, you know, I start to feel a bit uneasy. And Mike Rinder described to me that that the my particular case would have been of the utmost priority, of the utmost risk to the organization. When I asked him on a scale of one to 10, where would you place the, the, the level of risk to the organization? And he said 11. And so as a result of that phone conversation with Mike Rinder, um, I hung up the phone. I, I, let me tell you, I felt quite disturbed. The very next morning I received an email from him where he asked me if the phone call was recorded. Now, you have the former head of Office Special Affairs International, okay, who is known for fair gaming and destroying people's lives, okay? And now he wants to know if I recorded a phone call and because he is worried that he incriminated himself. Do you understand how terrified I have been for the last few weeks. Real quick, he says, hi Miriam, nice to speak to you yesterday. 
Did you record the calls we had? I want to note that if so, I would ask that any portion that anyone wants to use as are checked with me first to ensure they're in context and accurately reflects reflect my views. Thanks, Mike. You don't answer. Okay. I right? don't answer because I am now very concerned. So for Thank me, you. it was the phone call, uh, sorry, the phone call, the email the next day, and then two days later, a second email. Okay, now understand that when the police investigator first asked him for the affidavit, Mike Rinder responded, it's it's most likely lost kind of to that effect. Um, I have that. Specifically. And then he said, but I'll get back to you. Three months went by and he never got back to the to the police investigator. I had to follow up with him three months later. Okay, so but he wants an answer two days after. He writes, Miriam, as you have not responded to the email below, I assume the answer is yes, you did record the calls. The last question you asked bothered me as it was not designed to elicit information about your case, but possible incriminating information about me. I assume if you did record the calls, it was done under the approval of law enforcement. I doubt that approval extended to wider information gathering for some other purpose. If any of my assumptions are incorrect, please correct me. If you passed on any of the information you got to anyone other than law enforcement, please inform me, inform me who you told. I know there's a campaign ongoing to get me removed from the Board of Child USA. I hope you're not part of that. I didn't even know he was part of that. Now, what I noticed what he was doing is he was making these blanket statements as in, um, I didn't know anything about your case because I was working on the Lisa McPherson trial from 1996 to 2001. I okay. didn't know anything about Dick Hubbard, the case about Dick Hubbard, because I was the LRH PPRO. And, you know, and I mean, th there's the, fav the famous line, or, or I don't know if he said this directly, I'll be clear about that, but I've certainly heard it, and the belief is certainly perpetrated uh, that uh, um, from 2004 to 2007, he didn't know anything about anything because he was in the hole. Say that I've seen the recent OSA documents that have been released, and they detail, I mean, it, what's included in there is orders that he made, directives, programs he created um they they're from 2004 to 2007 he was very much in command of the office of special affairs international from 2004 to 2007 he sends you another email january 15th and he says miriam i finally got the information from the lawyer and i'm assuming that's pertaining to the affidavit right Correct. he says however unless you respond to my questions below I do not feel comfortable providing you with further information or assistance. It seems simple enough for you to answer, but apparently you don't feel the need to afford me that courtesy. Now you think you have nothing to gain from me. He says, I spoke to Kyle's replacement about the phone calls and will follow up with him this week. I'm trying to give you every benefit of the doubt and hope there's an explanation for what appears to be an underhanded illegal scheme that is ironically exactly what people claim i did when i was in osa 30 years looking forward to hearing from you in these emails that mike sent to miriam he expressed that he was worried about her recording phone calls and this person is a member of a public charity that is designed to help people leave Scientology. They have gone through some of the worst living conditions, emotional abuse and even physical abuse as well. Now I think anybody that is making people feel intimidated or scared to come forward or to communicate should not be a member of a board that needs to be able to deal with these people. One of the things Mike Rinder was responsible for was the bankruptcy and takeover of the Cult Awareness Network, a nonprofit organization designed to provide deprogramming and assistance to cult survivors. Now he sits on the board that is supposed to help survivors of Scientology. I'm not surprised that there is distrust and fear coming from stakeholders and potential recipients. 
Survivors need a safe space to land when they leave Scientology. I think it's a fair argument to say that Mike Rinder cannot provide that due to his extensive history in tricking, suing, lying, and destroying people. I think the best way that Mike can advance the movement is to continue to put Scientology into layman's terms, so law enforcement, the media, and non-Scientologists can fully grasp what these policies really mean. We are all working together in this effort to uncover the secrets within this organization. I think it's fair to assume that some newly declared SPs may not feel comfortable requesting help from a man whose literal job it was to fair game critics. I think it's in the best interest of the charity, The Aftermath Foundation, that Mike Rinder steps away from it. I think his work in exposing the information he knows about Scientology and its policies is so valuable to the movement. And I sincerely hope that he continues to do that. Nobody wants Mike to leave YouTube, and of the content I have seen, nobody has even stated that they hate him. Mike Rinder has made numerous statements expressing his regret for actions whilst in the cult of Scientology. There is certainly a lot of shame that comes with revealing how you were brainwashed, and unlike other executives, such as Tommy Davis, Debbie Cook, and Marty Rathburn, he has not slipped away into the background. I do believe him when he says he feels it's his duty to continue to speak out about Scientology. I don't believe he knew of every crime that went on within those walls. There are simply too many. All members of the Aftermath Foundation board have been subjected to emotional, physical and spiritual trauma. They were once contributors in documentaries as freshly out escapees. They are also children of Scientology. Children that want someone to take accountability for what happened to them. I don't think any of them wish any harm on anyone. I think they are trying to do what they think is right. I also think they need to hear what their community is saying. I hate to say this, but what have you ended? You've been out for how many years now? What have you ended? What's ended? Because all I see is not a proper investigation done. Victims not getting justice. And Scientology seems to be doing just fine financially. Anybody who has been in Scientology, born and raised, who has had bad dealings with the head of OSA, Mike Render, if they wanted to leave now and they hear somehow that Mike Render's on the board of this foundation, they might be too scared to reach out to ask for help to leave Scientology. It's about the children. That's what this whole movement is about. Save these kids, you know? If you're 18 or older and you wanna belong to Scientology, you do you, boo. Um, hey, that's your prerogative. You want to get involved in any kind of weird stuff as, as long as it's legal. Didn't Mike go to the FBI with a whole bunch of uh, information and evidence and stuff? Like, are, why are they sitting on this? Or did they not actually have enough proper evidence to be able to, to go in and, and, I don't know, raid the place and save the kids, right? Like, what needs to happen? And maybe people are just mad they're not ready to talk solutions. That's fine too. I, I feel ya. All right, this is what I think. These are my personal opinions. I did not consult a single soul on this. So <laughs> this is all my brainchild here. Take it or leave it. <clears throat> Mike Rinder, as much good as you have done in the past, I believe that it is time for you to resign from the board of directors from the Aftermath Foundation. Perhaps you could be retained for future, future consultation um, on a volunteer basis. I think that in order for trust to be rebuilt with the community and PR, public relations to be salvaged, that has to happen. So let's take the emotional charge things out of it that are Scientology and the Aftermath Foundation. Just completely forget those things exist. If you have a survivor 
outside of that that is going to a person that probably has information that could be important for her to understand what was going on and to get information and then at some point that interaction devolves into something that looks like it is perceived as unethical that is not okay so a person that is in the position to offer that help if they're going to self-incriminate somehow and to have all of these things go on they probably need to step back from doing that because it's going to get messy that's my opinion we all want the same thing the end of scientology abuses there seems to be some conspiracy that uh, there's this anti Mike Rinder hate group and there might well be one out there somewhere But I am definitely not in it I am just a person who cares about this community that wants to see the best foot forward and I'm trying to appeal to that and and ask for change I think it would be the best decision if Mike Rinder were to step down from the Aftermath Foundation board and to apologize and fix this with Miriam some other issues that have come up include the diversity of the board of the Aftermath Foundation. It's made up of couples that were all executive roles in the Church of Scientology. Now the executives are in the highest position, they're privy to lots more information than the regular Sea Org members, um, and they would have probable knowledge of many crimes. If they are claiming Scientology commits many crimes, there's no way that they couldn't have been party to any of them. Therefore, I believe there's a conflict of interest with the survivors that come out. Um, perhaps they end up asking for help and realize that some of the people that cause them harm are now the people they are asking for help. In a video posted by Mike Brown, he reveals that his mother, Rosemary, a recipient of the Aftermath Foundation assistance, expressed that she felt uncomfortable making a video with Mike Rinder. This is due to an incident that occurred when Mike Rinder was in the church. And I'm going to try to keep this as vanilla as possible because I don't want to share too much about my mother. But in this book, A Billion Years, Mike, uh, Mike Rinder, he, at the back of this book, um, thanks some people. My friends who helped me with unreserved kindness and generosity when I had nowhere to go, Tom DeVock, Ronnie and Biddy Miscavige, Jim and Sarah Mortland. Ronnie Miscavige is um, a, a figure in my life and in my mother's life that is not a great a memory for her. My mother worked for Ronnie for a number of years and enduring uh, the large portion of time that she was working for him. And he's the, the brother of David Miscavige, Ronnie Miscavige Jr. Uh, he was involved in very unethical um, things that were uh, sexual in nature while she was his secretary. And he would expose himself to her. He would uh, make uh, her give him massages. Um, it, it, and he would sometimes grope her. So those are the things that would happen. Now, one instance that Rosemary shared with me, and she shared this with me after all of this stuff started transpiring and the the Ford Green response came uh, with the fleas and dogs. And I knew that this was going to blow up. I, I talked to my mom and I said, Hey mom, this stuff's going to blow up. Um, I, I want you to know about it because I don't want you to be kind of caught off guard because for her, she's, it's hard for her to quantify the importance of these things. Like I know if literally all this, like if everyone stops watching all this stuff, we'll just do it another way. It really doesn't matter. It's the work's going to continue no matter what, but for her, it seems significant. So, um, I told her about this stuff and she said, Mike, I need to tell you something. And I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, I, um, I haven't told you cer a certain thing about Mike Rinder. And I, I do have this recorded. I'm not going to play it because I'm not going to put her through this indignity. But she, she shared with me, she's, she said, Mike, um, one time on a Sunday morning, uh, Kathy and Mike Rinder, they were in their room, the Rinders and the Miscavages, uh, they shared, um, a residence. And then uh, Ronnie and Biddy were in their room, and I'm pretty sure Biddy was asleep, dead tired, because she was always working so hard. Ronnie had come out in his towel, and through his towel had an erection, and um, fully visible, and uh, asked, and I was out there ironing clothes, and trying to make coffee, and trying to do what I was supposed to do. And he then uh, said he needed a back rub, so he she had to go over there and start rubbing his back. While this was happening, and he had himself exposed, Mike Rinder walked out of Mike Rinder's room and saw this happening and said to Ronnie, 
Ronnie, what the hell are you doing? Giggled a little bit, grabbed a cup of coffee, and went to work. According to Mike Brown, Rosemary had told him that Mike Rinder had witnessed her sexual abuse by Ronnie Miscavige and was upset to see that Ronnie was thanked in the brand new afterword of Mike Rinder's book, A Billion Years. Mike Brown expressed concern to the president of the Aftermath Foundation, Claire Headley, that they did not want to work with Mike Rinder in the telling of Rosemary's story, which I think is fair enough considering Mike Rinder and Rosemary's history. Mike Brown was told that this was not a possibility and Mike Rinder would be involved with the project. I was asked to work on this documentary and backed out when I heard that Mike and Rosemary had not been consulted about film festivals or pitches to production companies. I was under the impression that my role as an editor was to make what they call a sizzler, which is a short version of longer content for potential pitches. This project was paid for by the Aftermath Foundation. I received £1,188 on the 16th of October 2023. Upon finding out the problems behind the scenes, I quit the project. Twice I asked for bank details to issue them a refund, they did not provide them. Instead, they said I could send anything I felt was owed to the Aftermath Foundation as a donation. At the time of recording this video, I have yet to send anything to the Aftermath Foundation. I don't really want to be making this video. It hurts like hell to have people that you respect let you down in this way. It doesn't mean that I don't think things can get better. It doesn't mean that I don't think these people have done good work and intend to do good work. We need people to start taking accountability. We need people to be held responsible for some of these crimes. Who locked up Serge Delmar's passport? Who made Liz Ferris dig her own grave? These are your people, Mike Rinder. These are your people and you need to take care of them now. In Mike Rinder's blog post, he triggered the hell out of everyone with his dead agent pack. He took Mike Brown's private emails to the president of the Aftermath Foundation, Claire Headley, and took them out of context and used them to make it seem as there was some conspiracy against him. He doxed Miriam Francis and posted her LAPD police report to the internet. Mike Rinder knows that Scientology monitor his blog very closely. And he also knows how important this case is to Miriam and to the movement. And he posted that on his blog, handing it over to Scientology, to their Office of Special Affairs. He also took time to insult Miriam's advocate, Alex, from Down the Rabbit Hole News, which is not something you should be doing as a public charity board member. It's completely inappropriate behaviour. He did, however, offer an apology for calling his supporters keyboard warriors three months ago. I want to talk a little bit about accountability. Taking accountability can be really difficult. All of these people on the Aftermath board, Mike, Mark, Claire, Amy, Matt, they have all had their own traumas in their own rights. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, me and my dad are working things out. We're in contact again and a couple of months ago he sent me a document that he wrote up. He called it The Dark House. <laughs> Not really sure what the title is, but in that letter he addressed what happened with me um, and took accountability for it. And it wasn't easy, it wasn't perfect, but it meant so much to me as his victim as his daughter, that he apologised and we have been able to continue talking, we have been able to start from somewhere. Um, I have asked his permission to share this today and I'm going to read some of it out to you so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so this part of his letter kind of refers to 
when um, my mum was having problems in the Church of Scientology, she was declared PTS for a bit and she thought her mum was an SP and her mum was declared but then she was still having problems. So then they looked at me and I was six years old at the time. And this is what he writes. Um, as disconnecting from Marlene, <laughs> we've heard that name before, that was my mum's mum's name, um, didn't work, there must be another SP causing the trouble, and horribly attention turned to you as the cause. I might have the timing messed up here, but I'm pretty sure this started before going to the St Hill for OT3, and the chaplain from Manchester, you and Scarlett, was asked to help. He came to our house and put you on the e-meter. I'm not as sure exactly what he did and I don't think he was trained to give actual sex checks but I might be wrong. He came back and said you had the needle of an SP which I think would be called a rock slam. There are two types of SPs, one who oppose Scientology because they don't understand it and they can be educated and handled and then the real SPs who are plain evil. And the only solution is to disconnect, as these are the ones who react badly on the e-meter. So I have a wife who is starting to give me a hard time and is an alcoholic, and I apparently have a daughter who is causing this in my wife, and who will continue to destroy the family from within, including her brothers. The solutions being, fo the solutions being put forward were adoption or boarding school, both of which seem to offer a world of pain going forwards. Adoption would mean passing over an SP to an unsuspecting family. And how could I live with myself for doing that? Yeah, how awful. <laughs> In the History of Man book, Hubbard claims people are inhabited by at least six degraded Thetans and that these can cause trouble. And there were also OT stories of Scientologists suddenly healing or gaining abilities like new languages or skills. And this was put down to pulling in better thetans than these degraded ones. So I decided to actually solve the problem by getting the trouble causer to leave and be replaced by a good one. I'm pretty sure this was before OT3, so I didn't even know about body thetans. I was just operating from the history of man and these OT stories that were widely promoted. It seemed like the only viable option and was still technically disconnecting. There was no actual tech on this, but with a bit of mental gymnastics, I was convinced it was okay and would work. Communication could solve anything. <laughs> so I was going to ask this SP to leave. I might have to use Tone 40, as these SPs can be slippery little buggers. So that's how the whole exorcism thing came about. I am so sorry about it, and I wish I was in a better state of mind back then. But no excuses. That's what I thought, and that's what I did. Now, that was really hard to read the first time I read it. I've shared that with you today to show what taking accountability looks like. He admitted what he did to me. And he said sorry for it. And I believe that he is sorry. And I forgive him. And every single child of Scientology will have to have this day with their parents. Where they will have to forgive them. going to be different for everyone and some some parents might never take accountability never take responsibility and never be offered the chance to be forgiven it hurts us because we want to forgive you but we can't forgive you if you don't tell us what happened we can't forgive you if you don't take accountability and responsibility for the things you did as an adult as our keepers as, as our protectors so I am calling for Mike Rinder to take accountability and responsibility to see that he is not the person that should be dealing with victims and survivors I respectfully request that you step down from the Aftermath Foundation board. I request that the Aftermath Foundation reform and that its board members are not made up of purely ex-executives from the Church of Scientology. The group you are in 
was immensely harmful. And it harmed many of us and continues to harm many today. I've been struggling to kind of put my thoughts into one place and express how I feel about this because it just kind of makes me mad. I am not a lawyer, I don't speak legalese, um, I'm not a Scientologist and I don't speak Scientologies. I hope that this video will be met with understanding today. I am not on a hate campaign like I said, lots of people are upset and I think it's going to keep happening if nothing changes. I thank you all for your time, for watching this video and hopefully next time I see you it will be with something a little more fun. <laughs> I'll see you in the next one. Cheers guys. We fight and hurt each other Try to make it better. I can't seem to get it right. Won't let go of a pride. I can't see the pain like you do. No empathy remains. No openness for change. We're reaching for the light to get us through. God, we want more. You